I am a grandmother. I have four children, three girls and one boy, 13, 14, 17, and 19. Most of my children are taller than I am as well. But I also have a dog. I am not the shortest in my family, but he is much shorter than I am. It's a really small dog, but it loves deaf people and can understand signs. It really understands sign language well. I have worked at the World Federation of the Deaf for over 20 years. When I worked with the Finnish Association of the Deaf as an executive director, I became the first female director at FAD. Around the same time, I was a volunteer with the World Federation of the Deaf. WFD is under the headquarters of FAD. I have a staff of 50 people working under that organization. To date, I have been there for 60 years, being involved in deaf rights, human rights like language recognition, and equality rights. I've worked in a variety of capacities representing the Finnish government, and as you can see, my resume lists many of the accomplishments in my career as they span far and wide. In retrospect, I began my international work in 1987. And typically, people's initial question is, how did you become involved in international work? Again, while working with the Finnish Association of the Deaf, there was a group that I worked with simultaneously in Finland. It was an organization that supported deaf schools in Africa. It was mission work. They had students who were deaf and upon graduating had no cultural organization or opportunities for work, so they asked the FAD to work with them in collaboration to formalize opportunities for adults in the country. I agreed because I believe in promoting equal rights for deaf people all over the world. I started to work in Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and other places. It was an eye-opening and shocking experience for me to see how deaf individuals lived and how isolated they were. Only boys would be allowed to have vocational educational opportunities. The girls did not. The children got one meal a day and were very thin. They were extremely hungry, but never complained. I saw a lot of poverty and isolation. When I returned to Finland, working with the Finnish Association of the Deaf, we had our annual convention where they were protesting a number of issues, like how expensive the TTY telecommunication device was, and they complained that they could not afford them. I was taken aback by their topic of protest compared to the suffering I had seen in Africa. I thought to myself these were issues that the Finnish could work on and advocate for themselves. In contrast, I felt I could offer important support to Africa for the advocacy and issues that were more severe at the international level. Now let me tell you about my career. I was the Vice President for the World Federation of the Deaf. Plus, I was the WFD General Secretariat for eight years, 
and became president for eight years after Yerker Andersen, who was president for 12 years. He was an American, but born in Sweden. At the same time in those efforts, I worked in leadership positions with the Scandinavian Association of the Deaf. Sweden, Norway. Again, all in collaboration with my position. Around the same time, I also worked with the Finnish government representing the Council of Disabilities. That is how I continued with my international advocacy efforts. I have three honorary degrees. I believe it is important for me to point out my honorary degrees because in that way I can be a role model and hope that deaf women can receive even more honorary degrees in your efforts and career than I did. Hopefully someone here in the audience will receive four or more, so I applaud you in advance of what you will receive. My Doctor of Law honorary degree, that was from Gallaudet University. It's in law because I have fought for human rights for a long time. I received my second honorary degree, a doctorate of education, from the University of Javaskila in Finland in 2004. That honorary degree was for my long-standing efforts in promoting the education of all deaf individuals. In Finland, what we wear for graduation ceremonies is all black. My third degree in law I just received in 2013 in Dublin from Trinity College in Ireland. It is beautiful and the roads are so colorful and beautiful. The ceremony was beautiful. As compared to Gallaudet and Yavaskula, there were long lines. In Ireland, there were only four individuals for the ceremony. I was second in from the left. To my left you see John. He is the president of the Irish government. He and I simultaneously received honorary degrees. His was in law, as was mine. It was a wonderful experience. To his side is a taller gentleman. He was the president of the college. And lastly, the woman at the end of the line was the former president of Ireland. So those were the individuals present at the intimate ceremony. I was born hearing. At this time in our complex history, Russia and Finland encountered a difficult time as Finland wanted to remain independent, but Russia wanted control of Finland. It was a very challenging time, and many sick children that were hearing were not given medicine that they needed and became deaf as a result. They got illnesses that caused their hearing to degrade. Many of the children became deaf. When I was born, I was hearing and spoke Finnish. Looking back, I realized that I didn't understand what deaf was. My mother tried to explain it to me, and she said she would take me to the school for the deaf. I did not understand what being deaf actually meant. My other friends said, they will be deaf. I said I didn't know the difference between hearing and deaf. My mother took me there, and on the first day, I saw various boys and girls seated in a row.
I tried my best to speak, which is what I was accustomed to doing. I tried to speak to the girl next to me. She looked confused. I didn't understand. My mother told me she couldn't hear me. I realized she could not hear. And I figured out then that I couldn't hear either, so we were the same. So as a child, I did not understand. I would try to understand, and I tried to talk, and still she did not understand me. My mother told me she could not speak, and I tried with student after student until I realized none could speak like I could. It really hit me hard. Why wasn't I like them? How do they communicate? How do I communicate with them? A girl came in signing and speaking. I ran to her and asked her if she could hear, and she said no. I asked her if she could speak, and she said yes. Finally, I could relate to her as we were both deaf and could speak. Just the two of us. After an hour, another girl came in to take us to activities. She was signing, and the first time I saw it, the spirit caught me and I followed her and the rest of the students. I saw students signing, and I realized I was not a hearing person and had to let go of that identity. In the next few days, I started to learn sign language. They were like a family to me. And that is when I became part of the deaf world. The teacher wrote a report based on my performance and informed my mother, saying, Lisa is learning sign language very quickly. My mother was heartbroken. I didn't know it at the time because I was in school involved in activities. During the holiday, I went home. My family read the school report and wondered, what is Lisa learning? They didn't understand what was going on in school. So the family sat me down at home. My grandfather and grandmother were there. Father, aunts, uncles, and other family members were there too. I'm from a large family, and we lived on a big farm, so they were all close to me. One day our family sat around staring at me, and they said, Show us sign language. I said, okay. So I showed them some signs, and they started to learn. I taught them the sign for beautiful, and they were very excited to learn the sign language I was teaching them. I taught them another sign, horse. They picked it up easily, so we started signing to each other. It was so natural. It was a good and loving experience. The next day, my grandfather called to me in sign. He was riding a horse and signed to me, Horse, beautiful. And I loved it, so I went back to the school for the deaf, and the teacher said, Did you speak to your parents? I was very afraid I would be punished, even though I was nervous about it. I said, Yes, I did tell them about sign language. She said, good for you. I was relieved and surprised. My family wanted me to sign and communicate with them. Now the purpose of this story is to say my identity as a deaf woman grew because of that experience at the School for the Deaf. I was able to communicate with my peers and knew what it was to be deaf. It also shows my caring family. My family was wonderful and accepted me for who I was, and that fostered my identity and helped me to grow into who I am. That helped me be strong and confident in my life. I graduated from that school. We moved from the farm and lived downtown we moved to the capital city in Finland. They asked me if I would teach sign language in the area where I lived. 
At the same time, there was a government person giving a talk at the school. They talked about education. I watched this speech on education, and they said that deaf children did not have cognitive abilities. Yet in the government, they were experts on how to educate deaf students and what they were capable of. I realized that this person was responsible for the education, but did not understand who they were. This person understood nothing about deaf people at all. It hit me hard. So I decided to do something and change the path. So I pushed that the work with the children was important. And after watching what he had said, it occurred to me the sign language rights was key for the education of the deaf children. I loved reading books and telling stories to children was important for bilingual education. So I wrote numerous articles to try to talk to the government officials and that the problem needs to be rectified. As I worked for the Finnish Association for the Deaf, I worked with them to come up with committees and develop deaf education, and to help educate our deaf and hard of hearing children. As I started the work, I did not think I would become involved in the World Federation of the Deaf, and I did not see it coming. I saw the struggles and difficulties that I could help resolve. I felt a strong calling to negotiate and help on behalf of these groups. My work grew and grew. I joined my groups and my advocacy rights came to the international level. I was asked to chair and work with committees and groups. That is how I got started with the World Federation of the Deaf. So my work as I see it was trying to make the world a better place for the deaf and hard of hearing people throughout the world. I enjoyed solving problems and could benefit from learning this process. More and more countries asked me to lead workshops and lectures on important issues. I enjoy solving problems. I am sure you enjoy solving problems. This is an important skill to develop. People call me Mother Lisa, the mother of the international mother of the deaf community. I am honored. I ask you to take on this role and become the mothers to help the international community. I spent many years working with the United Nations, traveling to many countries. Typically, I go to New York City or Geneva for the United Nations meetings. And so I travel to both cities often with my career within the United Nations, working for laws to help with those with disabilities. Many times, I'd go to New York for weeks at a time, sometimes even a month, and I'd have no opportunity to meet any other deaf people, only hearing people. That last picture was from Russia. Russia's interesting. They are not a democracy. They're not a democratic country. The Finnish Association for the Deaf has many deaf individuals in leadership positions, but very few of them on the board are deaf. It's very different than here in America, where you have many deaf people represented and you have the ability to vote. That's not true in Russia. There are many businesses and factories where deaf people are relegated to work, and you see rows of deaf women working in factory positions, and men who are deaf are relegated to working in factory positions. They don't have many opportunities for anything else. It's often the administrators who will come as representatives and delegates. I would visit many schools for the deaf in Russia. Most of them are bilingual. 
Most are oral, and the Russian students are taught to use their oral skills to the best of their ability. Many teachers of the deaf teach speech. That's a tremendous growth. The culture in Russia is different than here. You'll recognize the popularity of dance, colors, and the festive nature of the children. They are proud of their culture. Women in Russia work in education, but have no leeway or power to control anything. They work, but they have no control. They don't think too much about it, which I noticed, and found to be interesting. That was a young deaf girl. These are the types of homes that are very common in the area. Families typically have a large amount of livestock and are nomadic in that the families move from one area to another when they change for the seasons. That's their culture, and that's been that way for many years. You see women everywhere, but they do not have power. To them, it does not exist. They do not see it as important. I realize every culture differs. There's a cultural tradition that they've had for centuries. Working with deaf individuals in the country told me some interesting stories that I'll share with you. Generations ago, if a man wanted a wife, he would find one. A cultural norm in their country was that a man would get on his horse, searching from home to home, looking for available women, and then would choose one to his liking. There were many men seeking wives. You would have multiple men wanting the same female. She was yanked from her home, put over his shoulder, and carried away on horseback. But today, the power has shifted. This is a wonderful thing to see the tradition shift. So women are now in control and choose the man of their liking. That girl on the slide is from Mongolia, and the man with her received a letter from the World Federation of the Deaf asking him to go to the World Federation Conference as a representative from the Asian Pacific region. When he received the letter, he couldn't believe it. He asked the government for funding to help him pay for his travels, but they denied his request. He asked many businesses for their financial support and was denied at every turn that he took. Finally, he told his father about the opportunity. His father looked at the letter and gave it some thought and realized how important it was for deaf people to come together at a world conference like this. His father owned a large farm of cattle, and he decided that he would sell however many cattle it would take, to raise enough money to allow his son to fly to Thailand and attend the conference. And he did just that. By selling cows from his farm, his son was able to have enough money to travel to Thailand for the conference. He purchased his ticket, but realized at that time that he didn't have enough money for a plane ticket. And so instead, he decided to travel by train which would take several days. To the travel agent, this young deaf man was very strong and strapping from the physical labor he did on a daily basis. So he would be safe to take the train and go to the conference. He loved meeting so many other deaf individuals. He met a variety of men and women from a variety of countries and learned of their experiences. 
At the same time, many people were deeply touched by his presence and his visit to the conference from so far away. He was asked about the value. He described what he shared from his country, that men and women are equal. Men and women in the family were equal, and they both worked to raise a family, taking care of the babies and sharing responsibilities. Just like in Finland, there was no oppression. Both men and women shared responsibilities equally. On the last day of the conference, the delegates gave each other small gifts as tokens. The young man did not see this before. As we were flying out, he came back to me. He said, this is a gift for you. It was a pleasure to meet you. I did not look in the bag until I was on the plane. It was a beautiful jacket with adornments that he gave to me, one of his most prized possessions. Imagine giving your coat off your back, the most valuable thing you own. It showed his incomparable sacrifice. One time in particular, there was a deaf woman's group that had come together. They were telling me of the type of work they did. There was a deaf school on the border just south of India, and it was a militarized border. There was a young girl. The girl was going to school, and she would face sexual abuse from the military personnel and they had mental and physical disorders as a result. One of the deaf women I spoke with worked with the girls and helped them with the experiences they had. In Japan, the sign for men indicates that men are superior and women are not. The point in Japan, they had been planning a world conference for the World Federation of the Deaf that would take place in Japan. I was working with the government and the officials from Japan to help plan and organize the conference. At the time, I was general secretariat. I would correspond with people in Japan, but they would never respond to me. They talked to the WFD president, Jürger Anderson, and then he came to me. They would not directly respond to me. This went on for four years. It was always that way. As this went on, I got more and more frustrated, but I decided I would try to communicate with them, even if they would not communicate back to me. I did not understand why they wouldn't talk to me directly. So Yerker Anderson and I flew in together. Yerker was carrying his suitcase and I carried mine through the Japanese airport. There were many Japanese men that came up and tried to help Yerker. As he told them that I had my bags too, they seemed not to care and kept on walking. Yerker tried to help. He picked up my luggage to help me. But I thought, as little as I am, I can carry my own baggage. Yerker wouldn't have it. He picked up my baggage to carry it for me. When they saw that, they finally went to help him. They would not help me directly. I pondered about it and said nothing. I think even Yerker was surprised. The next day, I went to the office, and I was meeting people from their staff. I introduced myself to a woman that worked as a staff member. And one of the people said to me, You and she have the same job, and the same job responsibilities. I was amazed by that, that a Japanese woman could be a delegate. So she and I started to have a conversation. And I asked her about her job responsibilities. And she said, well, I sharpen pencils, and I make the tea, and I arrange the flowers.
That was not in my job description anywhere. I tried to explain to Jurger what she said. Jurger explained to the men that Lisa was not a secretary, but a delegate, and that you need to speak directly to Lisa as a delegate from the United Nations. The Japanese men could not believe this. After the experience, Yurka retired, and a vote was held for the next president of the World Federation of the Deaf. In Japan, they did not want a woman president. In Austria, the Japanese would not vote for me, but they would vote for a man from Italy. Sixty-four people voted for me, and the men from Japan had to accept that I was the president. They thought the world would collapse. I was called to give a presentation there, and I went to explain what women's lives were like and that women could work and be at home. That people can both work in professions and that men and women can be equal. They had no concept and could not accept the concept of men and women being equal. As time went on, I visited Japan more often. And then the president of the Japanese Federation of the Deaf saw my work with the World Federation of the Deaf, and our relationship started to grow with much more confidence. With my work effort to work with them, their attitudes changed. Then the JFD president and other men thought women could do what I was doing. In Arab countries, it's accepted that women cover their heads. I've traveled to many foreign countries, and I've experienced many different cultures. At that time, I had not yet been to Iran. I imagined that women were very repressed in Iran. So I thought to myself, why would I have to cover my head with a scarf? It didn't really matter to me. I would follow their dress code if that was necessary, because what was important to me was that I was able to meet the deaf women firsthand and see what their lives and experiences were like. There was a conference on deaf education. Most of the individuals present were women, and they were teachers. They wanted bilingual education. Yet it was not as popular as the oral form of education or the signed education. The president of that government was a man, and the vice president was a woman, and I was called to meet with those government officials. I wanted to find out what the work and employment opportunities were for women in Iran. They assured me the headscarves are a norm, and I wanted to focus on the employment opportunities. It was important to me that the education of boys and girls was equal. They were showing me pictures of young girls in headscarves, long sleeves, and long dresses participating in sports with the boys. They were downhill skiing. They showed me several pictures like this. Clearly the kids were having fun with their dresses and headscarves flowing in the wind as they skied downhill. As I looked at those pictures, I had an idea. The Ayatollah was a dictator in the country. But the women were able to pursue an education and have jobs, despite the government tyranny. I visited deaf clubs, one in Jordan and one in Syria, and I'm sure you know of the wars 
in that area. So I had an opportunity to attend a deaf club. Keep in mind, the deaf clubs were limited to only men. Women could not be a part of the officials in the deaf clubs. They had opportunities, and I asked them about the opportunities. The men said we were government-sanctioned clubs, and the women could get together on their own. The women's club, oddly enough though, had quite a bit of money through sewing projects and selling small items that they made. They would give the proceeds to the men's club because the men had no way to make any money at all. But they would only give them a small portion of their proceeds from the sales of their craft items. I thought that was interesting. There were many hearing people in the tribe that knew and used sign language. They had a sign language numbering system so they could clearly communicate numbers. Many people in the tribe who were hearing signed very well. Because they were nomadic farmers, and they herded large groups of cattle in very flat country, their voices couldn't travel far enough to communicate with one another. So they used a visual language, or sign language, so they could communicate with each other at a great distance. It was very common in this tribe, and in their culture, for men to have many wives. There were several deaf members in this tribe as well. They also had many livestock and many wives. It was a tribal community where there was no discrimination and everyone communicated equally. In the world, there are isolated communities that sometimes use sign language for both deaf and hearing cultures. I never saw a culture where the opposite is true, where one woman has multiple husbands. I don't know if any of you have visited a country where polyandry is practiced versus polygamy. This is a funny picture I wanted to show you. My hair is windblown, standing straight up, and we're standing in an area where the two seas converge, the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. In this area, the wind blows at such a speed that it blows your hair into a cone shape. It was very funny. I was here in the United States for a wonderful visit, and it was great to work with the women here. All in all, I fear nothing throughout my entire career. When you see people in need, nothing is overwhelming. Nothing is impossible, and I have kept true to my heart the concept that we are all equal. No matter what any United Nations delegate or world leader says, I know we can work together to make the world experience better for all people. It's difficult to change the world. I won't kid you. Small steps take the effort of many, many people. We need research, and we need deaf women participants. There are not enough of them. When I first started my work with the World Federation of the Deaf and the United Nations, that's when it began its work on the Convention of the Rights for People with Disabilities. I can remember the first meeting had only 30 people.
It was a small gathering, and I was given four goals that were my charge. The first goal that was charged to my responsibilities was to have an official recognition at the government level of all signed languages, that sign language be accepted as an official language. Up to that point, governments didn't believe that that was true. They felt as if watching someone's hands flying through the air looked like they were simply swatting a fly away. So I recognized I would need patience to work on that goal. The second goal was to define what sign language was. Because if we could define it, the governments couldn't so easily dismiss it. Up until that point, they felt that only spoken languages were true languages. So I collected a variety of information to create a document on the article, and it was read and approved by the other delegates. The document explained and justified that sign languages were real languages. Though the task was done, I thought the governments didn't really understand what we were trying to do. The definition that we gave them was complex and too difficult to understand, and we were using verbiage that wasn't clear to the government officials. I felt it was important to simplify the definition, and so I recommended that we define spoken languages and signed languages and I made a differentiation between the two. The simple change in language made it more easy to understand for the government officials who were working with the WFD. Then we moved to the next charge of promoting the use of sign languages by creating laws that would enforce the promotion. We were supporting many languages, both spoken and signed. We tried to explain that sign language was not universal, they did not understand why sign language was not universal when Braille was universal and easily understood by all people who were blind. They did not understand why this was not true for sign language. It was my job to point out the importance of deaf people and their ways of life. We are a global society today, and the expectation to have one sign language can seem like an idea that would work when you have a convention with many countries coming together. You have a multitude of spoken languages being used. So why would you have a universal sign language? The United Nations has finally accepted this. As can be seen, delegates change. The goals of the WFD have been slowly obtained and successfully changed. It has been our steady work in advocacy. It has been our respect working with different countries and working to slowly change their beliefs and attitudes. China did not want to accept sign language usage, but confronted that they said the government said they have 20 different spoken languages and that you would then have 20 different sign languages. When you talk to governments, you have to talk to them and you have to assure them. Don't fight against them. Go with the flow. It's important to listen and negotiate. In this way, they will consider our suggestions and then make the recommendations. So attitude is an important part of dialogue and trying to see where they come from so we can explain our point of view in a better way. This book explains the process that we went through to get the CRPD to where it is today.
deaf and hearing people can work together to have a better understanding of one another that will open doors to a better future.